So thank you everyone for being here. Hopefully we'll have a few more folks hopping on and I'll let them in as we get started. Uh, my name is Elaine Haney and I'm a city councilor for Essex Junction. And this gathering today is um, sort of the brainchild of three people, myself and Bridget Meyer, who is on the call and uh, Representative Lori Houghton. We have been uh, longtime friends, but also longtime volunteers for Essex Junction and for our community. And we've been really um, excited about the wonderful things we're trying to accomplish as a city. We're still pretty new. We're still trying to figure out our way in many respects. And I know there's a lot of really excited volunteer energy out there. And we all want to make sure that that volunteer energy continues to be there while we figure out our path forward. So um, as you know, we are doing a strategic planning exercise with Ashley Snellenberger, our city comms director, taking the helm of that very big effort. And thank you, Ashley, for everything you've done so far. Um, and we're looking forward to the end result, which will be coming soon. But in the meantime, there's been a lot of talk among volunteers about like, what can we do? It's time to get started. We want to see what kind of things we could do next as a city. And so tonight's program is a generic conversation about what is economic development, what it looks like in a few other towns in Essex, or excuse me, in Vermont. And, you know, just to get our creative juices flowing, but also to provide us with some realistic expectations about what economic development means and how projects can be taken up and but sometimes how long they can take, but also how we can be strategic in planning one project after another in order to accomplish our goals in the long term. And thinking about that we have a comprehensive plan for the city, it's on our the city website, and that is sort of the roadmap for what Essex Junction is hoping for in the future, but it will be informed by our strategic planning process because the, the comprehensive plan is not updated um, super regularly. I think it's every seven or eight years we update that plan. So um, without further ado, I am really delighted to um, welcome to Essex Junction, Heather Carrington. Um, I met Heather um, quite a long time ago, back when she was the Economic Development Director for the City of Winooski, and um, she is now an independent consultant serving communities as they plan and implement their economic development plans. So welcome, Heather, and um, we're just going to have a little bit of a conversation, and then we're going to go into a presentation about what, what Heather does with her um, clients. So Heather, welcome. Thank you very much. And hello, all. Thank you for being here and for all the energy that you are clearly bringing to economic development in the city of Essex Junction. I'm excited to see where you're going. And I hope that I can give you a little bit of an idea of what you can expect in the future and some of the best practices that I've seen in a particular community that I've been asked to speak about. But I will say that having come from six years as the community and economic development officer for the city of Winooski, Winooski tends to slip in there too. So you'll get two for the price of one. <laughs> That's awesome. And Winooski really has it going on. So no objection to hearing about their success. So Heather, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Sure. Um, so as Elaine said, I was working for the city of Winooski for six years. Um, doing both community development and economic development, and the two touch each other in all kinds of different ways. Um, so I uh, I had on a lot of hats. So um, I am taking that, basically that experience and taking it out to the communities across the state. So the types of projects that I do as an independent, independent consultant include things like housing needs assessments, housing studies, economic development strategic plans. I do a lot of grant writing to help people to fund uh, their projects, particularly some of the more involved and complex applications for millions of dollars. Um, those are more require more capacity than a lot of municipalities have on their staff across the state. Um, I'm doing bylaw modernization to help support, remove barriers so we can support more housing development. Um, so a lot of park and recreation, a lot of park and recreation planning as well. Uh, downtown designations, uh, all kinds of state designations actually. And I help people to develop things like 
housing trust funds, small business lo revolving loan funds, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So when I was in Winooski, I did a little bit of everything. And now I'm kind of taking that out to the whole state. Can you touch a little bit on what you just mentioned about the difference between community development and economic development and how they overlap and, or how they are separate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, don't take any of this to be the definition of economic development and community development because there are a million different definitions and they don't all agree with each other. But in my opinion, the difference between community development and economic development is that community development is focused on quality of life and economic development would be policies, actions, programs that are focused on economic outcomes. So improve, improving economic outcomes for individuals and the community as a whole. So that may be growing your grand list so you have higher tax revenue, or that be, may be developing housing so that there's less of a cost burden in your community. It may be putting housing in the right places so there are customer bases and workforce for your community. Um, you know, it could be a wide variety of things, but as I was saying, they touch each other so much and in so many ways because improving economic outcomes does lead to improving quality of life. Um, so I, I think they're very much tied. I appreciate your sharing that small distinction because I do think we talk about both of those terms together interchangeably. And sometimes we mean the same thing and sometimes we don't. And I think it's important to understand the difference between quality of life development and economic development, the technical side of it. But I think tonight we're probably gonna talk about both. And um, so Heather has a presentation that she's gonna share with us about her work and what's possible. And then we're gonna leave plenty of time at the end for Q and A. So please have your questions ready. And Heather, I'm gonna let you share your screen and we'll have lots to learn from you. Well, we'll see. I hope that it's helpful. Um... So I'm going to ask everyone to save your questions until the end, just so I get through the content and we don't end up, I, I can really go off on a tangent with something. So if you ask me the right question, I'll talk all night. So let's make sure we get through this about half hour presentation first, and then we can open it up for discussion and questions for the remainder of the time. Um, so Heather Carrington, community um, and economic development consultant. Um, I want to preface by saying I've been invited specifically to talk about some of the work that I've been doing in the town of Hardwick. So this is not going to be the full range of possibilities. There is a wide range of possibilities for you, but specifically the projects I've been working on in the last two and a half years with Hardwick. And Hardwick is doing a lot of things right. So I want to share with you what they're doing right in this process. Um, and then let's see. We'll We've done our introduction. I think that was a full and thorough introduction. I'm going to go through what Hardwick is doing right. And you're going to have to bear with me as I am going to go point by point through a slide, because I want you to remember those points as we go forward and talk about the project examples. And I will point out and call out where they're doing each of those things so that you have a sense of how those can work. Then I'm going to give you a really quick slide that has so, so many available resources on it that you can use. Um, it's not the full spectrum. Again, we're talking about, you know, a one slide assessment of all of the world of resources that are available for economic development. And the state has a lot of them. So, but a lot of the ones that I have called out on the slide are actually things that Hardwick has used. Um, and then I'm going to open it up for questions and discussion. So pretty straightforward, really concise, I hope, really concise little presentation for you tonight. Oh, and I do want to caveat that I am not an employee of the town of Hardwick. I'll be speaking about the town of Hardwick, and I am working with them on all of the projects that I am talking about this evening, but I certainly don't represent Hardwick. I'm giving you my opinion about how Hardwick is doing and what they're doing correctly. And I know that they have been cited as a community that's doing things well. So I, I will share that. Whoops. Okay, long slide, but I wanna get these things in your head so that you think about them as we go through the presentation. They're using a strategic and incremental approach. They're not trying to do everything at once because it's impossible to do everything at once. And what you end up doing is diluting your effectiveness in each of those things if you were trying to do everything at once. The other thing is it's really important to establish the necessary foundation and the structures that you'll need to be successful with your implementation of your plans. So you wanna look at 
layering brick on brick and think of it that way. You know, you don't build a house by starting with the roof. You lay a foundation first. And so you want to start with a town plan that is a city plan in your case that is referring back to your regional plan, back to the state plan so that you've made a thread through all of them that is headed in the same direction. Um, you want to be sure that you're doing each one incrementally step by step. So take the time to do the full engagement of the community because if you have a community that is pulling in the same direction and agrees on that direction, it makes every single decision after that easier. It makes your success rate higher. So you can, if you have, um, an incomplete vision or a conflicting vision at the beginning of your process, when it comes time to decide on priorities, you'll find that you have a fight ahead of you every time you're trying to decide which direction to go. So laying foundations and being strategic and incremental is really important. I just talked about basing each successive plan on foundation of pre-existing plans, and that's really crucial in terms of being able to access the technical resources and the funding that you need in the future for big capital plans. Without fail, I write tons and tons of grants and I have a bizarrely, I mean, it's not going to last, I'm gonna cross my fingers, but I have a 100% win rate for about the last four years to the tune of millions of dollars, 15, 16 different grant applications. I, I shouldn't have said that because now I probably will not get the next one, but um, but the reason for that is because I am very careful about tying back to every layer of plan. So I am showing the state of Vermont, if I'm asking for their funding, how I am going, this project that I am applying for will be completing and implementing their goals. So you wanna make sure you're building it that way from the start. You want to build on previous successes. This is something that Hardwick is doing really well. Um, they had a very successful village center um, under the state designation program, and they decided to stack success on success and go forward with a downtown designation and expand that area and, you know, just continue that kind of success. So they're really going for the low hanging fruit there. They're like, OK, this is working. Let's do this more. Identifying underutilized assets and using them as opportunities is um, something that Hardwick has been great at. There, every community has that building that's been vacant forever that is you know, considered a white elephant in the community. And gosh, what are we going to do with that? If you get creative with those kinds of situations, you can really make some wonderful things happen. And there's funding available to take care of that sort of situation. Things that you know everyone sees as a blight in the community can offer you opportunities for success. So have that asset-based, strength-based mindset in looking at what you have and surveying your community. Engaging in commu the community envisioning and priority setting. Um, one of the things, I'm gonna skip to Winooski for this for a minute because Winooski has the most glorious setup that has been part of the big success there and getting a lot of economic development work done. And that is a very clear and very well agreed upon set of strategic priorities. So there's a strategic vision. There are four strategic vision areas and there are statements on what each of those looks like and what the goals are. Their master plan is built on that structure, those four strategic areas. And you can tie all of it back to the to the state plan, to the regional plan. So the community coming together and having the conversations that are necessary in advance to have a unified vision like that, you do not find a lot of people naysaying trying to implement those pieces of that plan because it took a really long time to put it together. And another piece of that for the city of Winooski is they put in place form-based code and that it's in itself was a two and a half year process and it was all community engagement. There were postcards sent to every single address in the city. It was long, 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 but it resulted in a code that people agree on. And so that's really crucial. Using data to drive decision making, it is shocking to me how frequently I find that narratives in a community are from decades ago. They don't line up with the current circumstances, and I've experienced that again and again. So actually looking at data sources to verify what the problems are in your community and what you're responding to, finding out, is this a problem we actually need to solve? 
is this a narrative that we need to address head on? Um, and if it is a problem that we need to solve, get the specifics. What are you solving for? What are you trying to accomplish? And use that to drive the way you're making plans and strategies and projects. Using data also is really wonderful for making the case for yourself. And I will talk about that a little bit with Hardwick. Um, we kind of hammered through some with some data, something that I, I didn't, I wasn't sure we were going to get to have happen. Right size projects based on understanding of town staff and funding capacity. And this is one that's really difficult. I mean, no one likes to hear that there isn't staff capacity to take on their pet initiative. And no one likes to hear that it's not a priority for funding. But, you know, when you think about the state of Vermont, you can have a staff that's hundreds of people, or you can have a staff that is one town clerk. And so those are very different situations and you need to make your plans accordingly and your strategies accordingly. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't get creative. You know, there are a lot of ways to um, bring in additional capacity and, you know, whether that's applying for grants to bring in consultants, you know, that's my bread and butter. That's how I go in and help communities. Um, and it also is what I did in Winooski because we didn't have, I, I was the community and economic development department. So any initiative that needed to happen needed to come through my desk and there was only so much time. Um, so I used municipal planning grants. I won six municipal planning grants in six years to bring in consultant capacity to run the projects. So I would identify, I would lay out the scope. And then I would hand it off to a professional to do it, you know, and lead our community through it. And that was instrumental in us being able to do some of the projects that we have done in Winooski. Utilizing all the state resources at their disposal, and I will have a slide of those resources, but there are tons of technical assistance programs and Essex Junction is not eligible for one of my favorites, which is the Rural Economic Development Initiative, but there, there are um, places that you can go where people will come in and help you to formulate your plan. So you don't have to go it alone. And another thing that I really think is important in doing this kind of work is understanding you are not going to know everything about economic development and all the different aspects of that. So bring in expertise wherever you can. Um, I, I brought in expertise all the time in Winooski because I just, I don't know the full spectrum of everything. And there are people in the state who can help with pretty much any niche that you need. Uh, employing adaptive reuse strategies to maintain their historic downtown fabric while accommodating current community needs. So, you know, Vermont has a reputation and a brand of these beautiful little downtowns with a white steeple church that maybe no one is using and has been vacant for a long time. Take that opportunity, use that opportunity. Adaptive reuse can be a crucial part of continuing to maintain that brand and move forward with need, with our current needs met. Uh, and lastly, recognizing that housing development is economic development. So I had stated before that, you know, we have really high cost. You have all heard about the housing crisis, the supply issue that we have. And the ways that that impacts us economically are really huge and they aggregate into a really giant problem. So when you have the level of cost burden that we have across the state, you have a community that doesn't have the disposable income that they might have otherwise. They can't support businesses in the way that they would otherwise. They, um, you can't draw new employees. You know, we we have a crisis with getting healthcare workers here. Well, part of that problem is we are we don't have the missing middle housing that's necessary for that bracket of income. So nurses can't afford our housing, and so you see that you know all over the state. So there's a wide variety of issues that are economic issues that are driven by housing. Okay done with that giant long slide and I apologize for that, but we'll come back to these things. So the town of Hardwick projects that I have worked on since February of 2022 are uh, their new down, uh, Vermont downtown designation, uh, created their downtown organization structure, funding and strategic plan. And that was part of the downtown designation that's required. You have to have a downtown organization for uh, a downtown designation. 
acquired a downtown transportation fund grant using that downtown designation pretty much immediately on turning around and getting that uh, getting the formal acceptance into that program. And I'm currently working on bylaw modernization with Hardwick in support of housing. Um, and that has been a project that has morphed all over the place because there have been giant shifts at the state level that have led us to shift our approach. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these. What you're seeing here in orange is uh, Hardwick's village center. The orange is the village center. And then the white boundary around it is uh, what we were proposing for the downtown designation and ended up being the final downtown designation. This is their central business district zoning. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this so that you can see the way that the analysis was done. Uh, the way that we build on existing successes, the way that we consider all of the various data to be able to put together what would be the appropriate downtown designation. These are town, the yellow are the town owned parcels that are underutilized parcels um, that present opportunities. So again, looking around your community and seeing where your opportunities are, especially if they're town owned parcels, you've got a world of possibility there. These are projects that were in various stages of development. Some of them just being pie in the sky, we wish we could do this. Some of them, like the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail was um, in the process of being completed at the time and runs directly through what would be the downtown designation. So a wide variety of different types of projects. Uh, we have an adaptive reuse of a historic structure. A, par a gateway park right along the Lamoille River, uh, a historic pedestrian bridge that was is widely beloved by the community that was called the Swinging Bridge that was no longer structurally safe, that connected from, let's see, um, one side, we have businesses all along here, and then businesses across the river down in here. Um, so it was a pretty important connector. It was uh, definitely a route that students took to school, but it, it tied together the commercial core of the district. So it was a high priority for the community. A giant library expansion, uh, redevelopment of their historic townhouse into a fully functioning community center. Um, and then a, another one of those, a vacant building, the Hardwick Bank, a historic building downtown, redevelopment of that parcel. So those are a few of the projects down there. Lamoille Valley Rail Trail was completed, what, in 2022, 2023? This is the little uh, swinging bridge that has been blocked off so that access across to the um, Central Business District was no longer available. Judavine Library, which is about doubling in size. This is the Hardwick Townhouse, and that's used as um, in the summer. It's for it's used for a summer stage series. Um, it's also where they have traditionally held their town meeting day. This is the granite shed, and that is going to become a multi-purpose space, which is uh, used for their summer farmers market and their winter farmers market. Actually, it's also used a lot by uh, school kids for a variety of purposes. So that will become a multifunctional space. Whoops. And just outside their downtown is the uh, Hardwick Yellow Barn Business Accelerator. And that is really going to bring together um, agri agriculture and cheese making. It has um, a, a very heavy dairy focus in a historic barn that's being rehabbed right at the gateway of Hardwick. So it's a really great project that's been strongly supported at the state level. So when you overlay all of those different things that I was talking about, central business district, town owned parcels, priority projects in the downtown and the current village center, that's how you come up with the designation that was asked for. Um, so, you know, using that level of analysis and thought, not just drawing boundaries, but deciding why you are drawing the boundaries that you're drawing makes a huge difference in making the case to be able to move forward with any project. So 
<laughs> when we presented that um, at the state level, we were told that, uh, let's see, it was too big. It was too linear, um, even though it's along a river, so you can't really avoid development being linear, um, that it could be supported, let's see, right about to here, cutting off some of the major projects, probably not crossing the rail trail. So what Hardwick did is com compile a whole bunch of data saying, here's why. An important part of designated downtowns is historic core. So we showed them here are all of the historic districts in Hardwick. You want it to be a five minute walk. While some of these areas seem far out because there isn't pedestrian infrastructure, which could by the way be covered by some of the incentives and funding that is available by a downtown designation. Um, it's not far away. This is the actual five minute walk. So there is a reason to include all of that. We looked at the density of habitable buildings and the previous village center didn't begin to cover where the densest areas were. So starting to serve those. And then I did an analysis of every downtown designation based on um, acreage by municipality and showed them that, listen, this would be in the lower third. This isn't too big. So the result was because of using data to make the case that it was approved as it was proposed. Um, in terms of setting up the organizational structure, this is one of those situations where you really have to understand, you know, this is not a community that has huge capacity. So the select board was very, very cautious about setting up a new organization and feeling like, well, it's just going to end up coming under our purview and we're going to have to pay for it. And we don't have taxpayer approval to do that. Um, so we got creative with this understanding the capacity, not allowing it to be a barrier to setting up a new organization, but understanding what we were working with. So we set this up um, with a part-time executive director, only 10 hours a week. You can start small and work incrementally on this sort of thing. And knowing that the town had just hired a part-time community development director, who was 20 hours a week, we looked at the possibility of combining those two jobs and making it into one full-time position with divided duties. And we made sure that the strategic plan aligned to the town priorities. So anytime this person is working, whether it be community development or as the executive director of the organization, it would be aligned to what the town of Hardwick was trying to accomplish. Um, and then, did a memorandum of understanding, which committed to only two years of funding up front, with the expectation that then the board would move to other funding models. And we had a list of what those funding models they would be looking into were. Luckily for uh, the town of Hardwick, um, there was uh, $25,000 per downtown designation approved as part of the state budget. So they walked in with an annual operating budget of $23,000, which then more than doubled when that was approved at the state level. And they were able to go forward with not having to use a shared position. They made it into a single position. But we did very carefully consider what the capacity limitations were and work within those capacity limitations. So I talked about building plan upon plan. So we looked at, um, when we did the Hardwick Downtown Partnership Strategic Plan, we looked at the Vermont Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, the Vermont State Plan. We looked at the regional plans and the regional economic development strategy. We looked at the economic development plan as part of the Hardwick Municipal Plan and then built from there. So each level we were just honing what, so at a, I'll give you an example, actually, I have it on the next page. Um, so Vermont strategic plan goals, big, broad, grow the economy. Northern Vermont Regional Comprehensive Economic Development Strategic Plan says, encourage communities to apply for designated downtown village center status. 
town of Hardwick municipal plan said the town manager, the planning commission, and the select board should investigate downtown designation for the village area. Then we got that designation and immediately started implementing some of the economic development plan from the town of Hardwick municipal plan. So two of the things that were done immediately, we got the approval in the end of January, 2023 as a downtown designation and immediately went for a downtown transportation fund grant. I think it was due less than one month. The application was due less than one month after the we received the designation. But what that did is it demonstrated value immediately for the community. So any naysayers who had wondered why we have to go through getting this designation saw $200,000 come in the next, it was within two months. And it was brought in through that Hardwick downtown partnership that was established. So being able to show that value and being able to demonstrate success builds success and it builds buy-in and it builds join-in in your community. And that's exactly what happened. So where there had been some questions about what's the use of having this downtown partnership and this new designation, they saw it immediately. Um, so it was, it was really, really useful for the community. So I'm going to move into bylaw modernization. Um, and I'm just going to talk about this briefly, but uh, the bylaw modernization project, again, this is another one of those projects that it requires a ton of community engagement. It requires a long time to do it. Um, it's two years that we'll be working on this all together. However, um, we're doing enough community outreach and engagement and have been from the beginning. So key stakeholder meetings, focus groups, we had multiple presentations to the community where I came in and spoke to the community and explained the things that we're looking at. You know, every public meeting, obviously, of the planning commission is available for public engagement, but people don't run to planning commission meetings to discuss bylaws. It, it just doesn't sound that interesting. But um, we had a few public engagement meetings just to discuss, here's what we're thinking, are we on the right track here? Um, and had some pretty good feedback and people showing up and made some adjustments based on that feedback. Um, so now we are in the stage where we're about to start, we're about a year and a couple months in, and we're about to start the public hearing process through the planning commission, and then we'll go into the select board adoption process. Um, and we have reached out to impacted parcels with letters, and we are not hearing any pushback at all. The planning commission, uh, the last few meetings we've had, it's all been from the community. And that's because people were brought in early and often. So we were able to course correct where needed to be able to be sure that this is reflective and representative of what the community wants. That makes a huge difference. It, it makes everything so much easier. And having that flexibility to be willing to hear a critique and shift is really important. Um, they also, Hardwick did something really great here, which is they use the Rural Economic Development Initiative, which is only available for towns that are under 5,000 people in population, but that program will pay for a consultant. Uh, it's just a straight up grant to build capacity in rural communities. So they went through that program and um, they requested, because I had worked with them in the past, um, they I'm sorry, I, that I'm completely off base here. I'm sorry. That was for the downtown uh, transportation fund grant that they used the ready program. But they requested, they requested me through that and I wrote their grant application for them um, completely at no expense to the town of Hardwick. I'm sorry, bylaw modernization, they are also using grants and that is the Vermont bylaw modernization grant. And again, this could be something where they don't end up having to pay any funds to do this project, um, this two year project with a consultant because the bylaw modernization program will forgive any match 
if the bylaws are adopted at the completion of the project. So I think there's every reason to believe that this will be a project that's paid for by the state um, for the town of Hardwick. And bylaw modernization is available to Essex Junction, as is the municipal planning grant and a variety of other things that you might find useful for building capacity. Heather, quick clarification. When you oh. talk about bylaw modernization, are you is a bylaw the same thing as land development code? Um, bylaw is not necessarily a term we really use here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it differs from place to place, but it, it's generally your zoning and land use regulations. So some people have zoning regulations and some people don't. And some people have unified land use and zoning regulations. So it depends on the community, but it really is your regulations of what can and can't be built in your community and how that needs to be done. So dimensional standards and density standards and how many parking spaces are required if you're gonna have a certain use, allowable uses and uses that aren't allowed. Um, so that's what I'm working on with Hardwick. And when I started working with them, I was working from what is commonly called zoning for great neighborhoods um, from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And that really gives you six different areas of focus to look at to help your communities to be more vibrant, more welcoming to additional housing, to be walkable, uh, you know, to um wide variety of things. But um, so I was following that and I have a, a system that I use for looking at zoning in comparison with that. And then about two months in is when the Vermont Housing Opportunities Made for Everyone Act, the HOME Act was enacted. That was June of 2023. And that, that has statutory requirements for what needs to be an allowable use within areas in municipalities that are served by municipal water and sewer. And most of the areas that we were looking at as part of this bylaw modernization fall under that category. So the HOME Act really does enact a lot of the things by statute that are contained in the Zoning for Great Neighborhoods document that I was using anyway. So we just wrapped it all in to bring them up to compliance with the Vermont Home Act. Um, again, this has been a long process. It will be a long process, but the result will be much clearer regulations that allow much more density of housing. And because that's something that has been established as a priority in the community, I haven't seen a single person walk into one of these meetings and say, I, I don't want four unit homes on my street. We're a single family home neighbor. It's just they've had that conversation in the past. So we're not having it now as we're trying to implement it. It was taken care of long ago. So here's my huge long slide with a bunch of different resources. Um, and these are by no means all of the resources, but you know, planning resources that are available to you, municipal planning grants, as I said, are really great. Bylaw modernization, you may not need that at this point because you have fairly recent bylaws, I would assume. Um, Vermont Community Development Program planning grants, better connections, better places, all of these can be really wonderful. Um, There's so many partners. I've just put a few of them here that Hardwick very specifically did partner with. Um, regional planning commissions are excellent resources and you can get some of your projects put on their annual work plan because, you know, with CCRPC, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, they have an annual work plan and all of the member municipalities pay in. So you get a certain amount of work from them, you know, as a consultant sort of every year. So you can prioritize some of your projects for being worked on by the planning commission. Um, Let's see, data sources, these are giant. I use all of these data sources all the time. So this is where you can really, this is how you win a grant. <laughs> this is how you make the case. Um, US Census Bureau data, it helps me to define what the problem is or is not in a community. Vermont Housing Finance Agency has housingdata.org and you can find so much information specifically about Essex Junction within this. You can search all of their different data on housing by community. So it's really, really helpful. You can also look at the county, you can look at the state. I use that all the time. Um, 
Vermont Department of Labor, you can look at that data. Not everyone thinks to look at that, um, but you can see where people are commuting, where they're commuting from into Essex Junction, all kinds of great information, how many jobs there are within a certain area. Um, so really useful there. And then just a list of capital project funding. And I have used almost all of these. Um, let's see nearly every one of these I have used to implement projects. And that's one last thing that I do wanna say, when you're looking to fund projects, be strategic, find the places where you can pull a little bit, well, this will cover the sidewalk and the benches. Well, this would cover undergrounding the overhead wires. Well, this would cover pavement, this would cover bike racks and just knit them all together into one project where you can really reduce the impact on your local tax base. I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna open it up for questions and this will all be available. So feel free to refer back to that. Heather, this was fabulous and it, it was overwhelming for sure, but I feel like you gave us a wonderful breadth of what's available to us and what's possible. And um, thank you for that. And I just wanted to emphasize something I dropped in the chat earlier. Essex Junction does have a village center designation because we have been a village. And we also have a neighborhood development area designation, which sort of expands the boundary of the village center designation to allow for more economic development in a wider swath of area. And um, our next session together will be um, on March 29th, we're gonna to talk to Katie Trouts of Montpelier Alive, which is the downtown organization of Montpelier. And so we'll learn a lot more about designations and what, what downtown organizations can do. I just wanted to let folks know about that. But Heather, thank you so much. And folks, please, what questions do you have? What, what ideas do you want to bounce off Heather? I feel really inspired and I'm suspecting that a lot of you are as well. Happy to answer any questions if I can. I'll tell you if I don't know. Don't be shy. <laughs> I know I just spewed a lot at you, so I apologize for that. I can't help it. I was trying to give you everything I could think of. City Councilor Marcus Serta, go ahead. Oh, geez, don't put that pressure out there on me. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, Look, this is really great, Heather. I really appreciate you going into this. And, um, you know, I guess what I'm what I'm taking away from this is I can't wait for the final take on our on our strategic plan. But there's just so much out there that I did not realize was out there. And so, um, you know, again, if we take this one piece at a time, right, incremental, then uh, we got to get that plan and then we can kind of go from there. But I, I really appreciate because if nothing else, you, you did show us there's a lot of possibilities and angles we can take to get where the community wants to go. So I, I just want to say thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad that was your takeaway because there are so many resources and possibilities. If I recall correctly, our comprehensive plan is on the schedule to be rewritten or updated in the near future. Ashley, I may have the timeline wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure we have some community conversations coming up about that. Would that be correct? I'm not for sure. I believe the last time it was done was 2019 and I'm not for sure how, what year, um, how long we have to have that in place before we start recording that. Okay. Beth, do you wanna answer your question out of the chat or ask your question out of the chat? Sure. I just wondered if there was a quick link to the strategic plan that uh, Marcus mentioned. I just did a very quick, a sloppy search on the website and did not see it. But um, again, it was quick and sloppy. So if somebody has that super handy, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, let me just. Or if you can tell me, like, go to this. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, I'm just going to. Just so that I make sure I'm telling you. So if you look under news and initiatives um, yep. on our website, um, it's the vision and strategic action plan. And if you click on that, that will take you directly to everything that we've done so far. Our um, 
next council meeting, we'll be um, going over the draft final report and kind of doing an overview of what we've done so far and our last steps for that strategic planning process. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now and everything from all the surveys that we've done to our think tanks, to our focus groups, all that information is on the website for you to look at and view. Um, and also, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. My contact's on the main site. Um, and down the very bottom, you can see a contact information uh, button, and you can click that and ask me any questions if you have questions about the strategic plan so far. Ashley, that is a great foundation that you have helped us lay for this process. And I'm putting into the chat a link to the Essex Junction Comprehensive Plan, the document that um, Ashley referred to from 2019. That's sort of the roadmap for all the things. It has subchapters on land use and flood hazards and energy and uh, recreation and all sorts of stuff. So you can see where we're coming from and then where you know the strategic planning process will help us determine where we're going. Greg, did you have your hand up? Sure. I always have a question. So um, can maybe you have a handle on this, but how much of a hole is Essex Junction in um, being located in Chittenden County, not being classified a low income community, I believe, uh, not being rural, which opens up a number of doors, and being the home of the state's largest employer. Um, and so there may be a sense in Montpelier or elsewhere that, that well, we have, we have global. So, you know, there's not an issue here. So, ha because I, I would congratulate you. I think you actually pick the two best communities for a consultant to work with. Winooski, which is the home of Vermont diversity, and eligible for all kinds of attention because it's in Chittenden County, but a community that, that you know, I mean, well now of course there's the gentrification issue in Winooski, but it, you know, that, that was a great choice. And Hardwick is really the all-star of the rural communities in Vermont because of the, the centers for excellence around agricultural innovation. So how, how far behind are we because of our characteristics um, yeah, in that in that game. Let me put it to you this way. Um, I won a million dollars for um, North Hero, which is uh, one of the few places in the state that's not eligible um, for it's one of the only Grand Isle is the only attainment community in, in the state. So what I would say to you is this. And it who did you get that from? Who did it come from? Northern Border Regional Commission. Yeah, we're not eligible for that either because they're up north, right? No, no everyone in Saunders every would, no, it's statewide. That's Saunders statewide. Loves us, but he's not going to give us money. You can't. It's it's think. statewide, and is honestly, it? yeah, Chittenden County is absolutely eligible. Yeah. Um, I won some for Winooski. Um, I've won three, four of them. Um, but but actually, they were much worse off in North Hero because Grand Isle County. It, as a county isn't eligible. It's the only county in Vermont that isn't eligible. I had to make the case that North Hero is eligible. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying to you is this, what matters is the way that you select the types of grants you're going for. So if you were, if I were in your shoes, I would be looking at um, supporting, for example, housing near transportation and near uh, jobs. You have an you have a strategic advantage in that in that type of a grant where they're more likely to fund you because you have the things that meet what they're trying to accomplish. So you really have to change your mindset and frame the way that you look for funding to meet your community's specific uh, circumstances. It can be done. So you I think guarantee we're, it. So you think we're not in as big a hole as I tend to think we're in. I, mean, I don't think so at all. Okay. I, I actually think you're in a moment of opportunity right now. Um, having just incorporated as a city, I think at a state level, there are going to be funders who are looking to invest in you and looking to create, be part of a successful new city of Essex Junction. And, and they're going to want to point to that and they're going to want to put that on the cover of their annual report. Um, so I think you're, I think you're in the moment, a moment of opportunity. And so you're talking about private funders now and not government funders, it sounds government like. Government funders, government funders. Government funders annual reports, yeah. okay. 
Yeah. Marcus, go ahead. Um, I'm going to ask a broad question, Heather, to get your opinion on this, because I've been thinking about this a lot lately in regards to housing, because I agree with you that housing is part of economic development, right? Yeah. Um, and in line with what the state's doing, and I think where we want to go, we're looking for all types and varieties of housing. But what I see locally is more and more rentals and not, I mean, it looks like the percentage of rentals to condos, to single family, it, to those dynamics, it really is leaning very heavily as a high percentage of rentals. And I'm not sure if that's, if, if, if it would be your take that that's the mark, just the marketplace right now, or if this is because the dynamics of these communities are leaning toward going that type of housing. Because I think here in Essex Junction, what we heard through our recent strategic discussions is really wanting a variety, but developers just seem to be coming to the table recently with apartment dwellings. Yeah, um, so I would argue one, any housing is housing that we need. I, I will take anything, give us any housing. You know, the supply is such a problem. Um, I, I'm just finishing up working on the Vermont uh, State Housing Needs Assessment. Um, so key takeaways from that. Um, we need small units that are one bedroom more than any other, uh, the, the dynamics are absolutely messed up in the state. We have housing that was constructed, you know, large swaths of it was constructed prior to the to 1940. And that's a time, if you'll recall, when you had three generations living in a home. So that's, you know, grandma and grandpa lived in one of those bedrooms. There were bedrooms for many more children. Um, and what's happened since then is if you walk through the decades, you see like, okay, in the 50s and 60s, suddenly grandma and grandpa like peeled off. So now that one house is two houses. And then in the 70s, you had divorce really become much more prevalent. Okay, now that could be that one household has become what? Three households, maybe four households. You have children growing up and not partnering off and not, you know, until they're much, much older. So it's not cute to live with five friends when you're 35. And that, so that now that household has peeled off into like six houses. And we're just trying to catch up with that. Over 70% of households in Vermont are single person households. So, or, no, I'm sorry, single person or a couple households. So having household housing that has one bedroom or two bedrooms is an affordability issue because when you have to pay for more, you end up paying, like I just did a study in one particular town, going from a one bedroom to a two bedroom meant um, an increase of 12% of the average renter's annual income. So anyway, I get off on a tangent and I get excited. Um, what I will say to you is any kind of housing is the housing that we need. The reason that we haven't been getting condos is because until recently, uh, the financing didn't work on that for some reason. I heard that from people who are experts in housing. I do not know the details about why that is. That has recently changed. So condos have become um, more feasible recently. But you're right. We need a broad variety of types of housing to be able to accommodate people throughout their life cycle. And we unfortunately are not creating that broad variety. But I would argue that most of our housing in the state is single family homeowner homes. So we're really just balancing the market by getting some rentals in there. Yeah. Does that I help? Yeah, no, and I appreciate that that insight because uh, again, I, I agree with you. Any housing is good housing. I I don't debate that at all. I'm I'm just I guess I'm concerned for two distinct groups of people: the younger individuals who don't have the opportunity because of the cost and such to have uh, a small enough home that they can buy their first right and start their better economic journey. And the other is the seniors who want to remain in the community, but want or need to downsize for their own financial future. And we don't have, while we might have some rental opportunities there, many of them want to move from 
ownership to ownership, but we just don't, we're not seeing that. So I guess those are the two buckets that I'm kind of a little concerned. I'm concerned about all of them, but I mean, that was just one, a couple that I was thinking about recently. So thank you for that. Yeah, Marcus, you're right to be concerned about both of those. And one thing that I would point out um, for those older people who want to age in place, but maybe have a home that's too big or too expensive for them, I would certainly point them in the direction of looking at uh, Vermont Housing Improvement Program funds, which can be up to $50,000 for renovating existing homes so you could create an accessory dwelling unit with that um, that you could then move into and rent out your house. Um, you could subdivide an existing home into several smaller units. So that's something that has the potential to assist with that, but certainly doesn't solve the pro problem single-handedly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um. So we're pretty much close to time. Um, if anyone has a brief question, we could do a brief question or we could wrap this up and I can follow up with some notes. Does anyone have one more quick I, Go ahead. Chris. I have a quick question. Heather, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, lots of information. Makes me want to go visit Hardwick. I haven't been up there in a long time. Um, you should go visit. I will, I will actually. Um, you mentioned you know early on, bring in expertise, right? So contract out to subject matter experts in this stuff. I mean, just writing grants and stuff. Is or just it, discuss with them, not even hire them, just discuss with yeah. them, call them. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. So in your experience and your years of doing this, have, you know, cities and villages and towns like us have, is it foolish to even think about going this alone and trying to do this in-house, so to speak? Or is it, is it just obvious? Maybe this is a self-serving question because you're a consultant in this field. But, you know, I mean, if, um, you know, would it be, it just seems like, like, you know, Elaine, everybody was saying it's just a lot of information. I don't know how we would do this part-time among 12 people or whatever, right? Well, you're really fortunate in having a city manager in Regina Mahoney, who is a professional planner. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, and has been doing that for a very, very long time and has helped other communities to do planning. Gotcha. So okay. I think you guys are in a very good position and probably don't need to be too worried about that. But that's not to say that you shouldn't be reaching out to subject matter experts on specific questions or you know, mm -hmm. pulling someone in for a project that they have specific expertise on, but you guys are pretty well set. Gotcha, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would agree with Heather on that, Chris. And uh, thinking back to what Heather said about acknowledging the capacity of the municipality, right? Um, we definitely have extremely talented planning staff and we're really fortunate in that. And also the people in this Zoom room and there is a wide variety of people out in the world also who wanna get their hands in, in this kind of pro uh, these kinds of projects and roll their sleeves up. And I think our next conversation about a downtown organization will put a little bit more meat on this bone. Um, and then Ashley will come out with a final report on our strategic plan. So I think that all this, all the, the foundational material we need is coming really soon. And then we can start prioritizing things and then really like actually start doing stuff. And I think one of the key things I wanted folks to understand from this presentation was how long things take. And, and just moving at the speed of government is not because government wants to move slowly, but because that's how it moves. So we're gonna help move it along more quickly because we have this avid base of wonderful motivated volunteers. So, well, Heather, it's, it's 7.30. Just one quick thing. I just have to pitch on the link thing. I mean, we spent 10 years cultivating ladies staff to get an earmark to rebuild our train station. Yes. And then the game changed at the end and there was no mention of a of a of a match. And now we have a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar match that that the, the feds want before they're going to give us the three million. So and we don't own the train station. There's all these issues. But, right. uh, but we managed anyway, it just takes a long time. I couldn't right. agree. And, and we managed to put in place a local option tax, which has enabled us to make that match, right? So like we are right. doing, there's some really good things Essex Junction has done. And I'm super proud of how we've sort of started, you know, stacking our cards and making sure we have what we need. So to be continued, and it's going to be really great. And so Heather, 
thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing with us what's possible. And um, thank you all for being here. I hope you'll join us on May 29th at 6.30 as we talk about downtown organizations. And let's just keep building that momentum and excitement. And I'll see you in two weeks online. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you all.